Alrighty, welcome. I am Heather Pierce Campbell, the legal website warrior. I'm an attorney and legal coach based here in Seattle, Washington. Welcome to another episode of Guts, Grit, and Great Business. I am so excited to bring you my new friend, Tom Poland, today. Tom's on the other side of the world, so he is starting off his morning with us. Hi, Tom. Um, Tom is a multiple best-selling author who has been published physically in 27 countries. Over the past 41 years, he has started and sold five businesses, taking three of them international, and has led teams of over 100 people with annual revenue of more than $20 million. Today, Tom teaches his unique webinar marketing method that made him so successful and which has helped thousands of clients globally enjoy the prosperity that comes with a weekly flow of high quality inbound client inquiries. Tom lives in Castaways Beach, Australia. He is the author of Leadsology, The Science of Being in Demand. He teaches his unique webinar marketing method, helping thousands of clients globally with inbound lead generation. Um, and from LinkedIn, I just had to share this because I love your, um, actually several things that you say, but that you've had the privilege of sharing speaking platforms with Michael Gerber of Emith, who I love. I'm a huge fan of Michael Gerber. And Richard, I'm not sure how to say his last name, whether it's Coke or Kosh. Kosh. I'm glad I asked. From the 8020 principle, uh, Brian Tracy and many others. And then um, I love the last part. I'm voluntarily married to a uber pretty German Frau. And because I'm from New Zealand, originally we're known locally as the Kiwi and the Kraut. <laughs> I just had to share that. I love that, Tom. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's, yeah. Um, we, I mean, folks, you don't know this, but before the interview, Heather and I spent about 15 minutes fixing the world. That's right. So we, we had a lot of values in common. <laughs> That's right. There's a lot to be fixed, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Tom, I'm so happy to have you. So for people listening, Tom and I just met recently through a group we both participate in. But uh, the funny part is on the last call, I was like to the whole group, you know, I want to learn this thing and how to do webinars and blah, blah, blah. And people are like, oh, you just need to go pick up Tom's book, which I'm doing. So Tom, you're next on my list of books to read. Super. Yeah. So tell me, how did you get started? What did your, how did you get down this path of becoming um, the Leadsology guru? Well, it, it actually started decades and decades ago and ended up here. And the, the origins of it's pretty simple. And that is, I started a business when I was age 24, which is, holy cow, 40 years ago, almost. Um, yeah, 40 years ago. Anyhow, um, but, but I, I'd heard this thing about nothing happens in a business until something is sold. Mm. You know, you can't pay suppliers, you can't invest in research or development, you can't pay yourself uh, and so on and so on. You can't even buy some copy paper and so on. And I, and I thought about that and I thought, yeah, but you can't sell anything until you've generated an inquiry. So it seemed to me that the pointiest end of my business was going to be lead generation. And so, you know, I've always said the secret of success is not that you have to be smart and that rather you only have to be smart to know, enough to know how dumb you are. <laughs> you, can, you can just be smart enough to know that you're stupid in a certain area or ignorant in a certain area, you can get help, right? So, right. you know, I've always been an avid reader and consumer of books. Um, back then that we had, uh, believe it or not, we had records, vinyl. I love it. Learn from Earl Nightingale and Norman Vincent Peale and some of the early greats. Uh, we got into cassette tapes. I'd listen to cassette tapes. I'd go to seminars, workshops, everything I could do about marketing, about sales mm -hmm. and about marketing. I mean, I would literally fly to another country and do a seminar and a workshop and come back and implement. And I'm a pretty good implementer. But to my, to my repeated disappointment, nothing made much difference. Mm. You know, I could learn copyright and send out 10,000 direct mails. Yes, yeah, some of it worked okay, but it didn't really, it wasn't quite as good as people told me it was going to be when I bought their course or their program or their workshop or their book or whatever. So basically I sat down and tried to figure it out myself. And, and I realized that the reason why a lot of it wasn't working is that a lot of the marketing advice I was buying into was actually general marketing advice. So it was meant to work for the dry cleaner versus the consultant right. versus the manufacturer versus the, I don't know, the building contractor or the mass art therapist. And it was just too broad and too general to work for, for me. So, Long story short, I figured out that marketing for services advice was different. Yep. And that's what started me on this journey. It was actually a journey of frustration and disappointment that ended up with the science of being demand, which is the whole ideology thing. What, what do you have to do 
if you're not offering a physical product, what do you have to do to get people knocking at the door? Mm -hmm. Well, and it's so interesting you say that it was the journey of frustration and disappointment that resulted in this thing, right? A huge right. part of the conversations that I have on this podcast, which is titled Guts, Grit, and Great Business, is about how sometimes being in those hardest places is actually what leads to the next evolution of our business or the next thing or or making a decision that actually creates the success, right? Versus... I, I, I would say it's the reason we're alive. Yeah. It's the reason for being in a human skin is the challenges and the obstacles and the effort and the thinking that are required because that involves consciousness. And to me, consciousness is the, the highest value because if we get conscious, we become loving and happy and fulfilled and we're mm -hmm. present and uh, we stop being sociopaths and mini narcissists and we actually start making the world a better place. So those things that we think we don't want, we need. <laughs> mm, I love that. No, it's it's so true. And I think so often it's easy for people to fall into the trap of thinking this shouldn't be happening or it's not supposed to go this way or, you know, any of the number of things that we think when we're yeah. in a period of compression or hard times or struggling to make ends meet and, you know, a variety of other things that are happening currently in our current market. Yep. And it actually, you know, can be from those moments. I mean, I even look at my sister and I use her as an example frequently, but, you know, she went from being a mom that had very little work history, was married, had a couple of small children, both boys that were like, you know, one and three. Anyways, her husband cheated on her and all this horrible stuff happened and they ended up in a divorce. And she went through a really tough period, like, tears every day period where she was trying to figure out how to make ends meet, you know, how to provide for these little boys, how to negotiate her new life without having much work experience at all. And, you know, she's now three years, you know, past kind of some of the toughest waters, but I mean, she is tough as a diamond. Like right. it's really true that she was faced with a series of hurdles. I mean, in the midst of her trying to gain employment and learn all these skills, her husband wow. sued her for sole custody of the children and dragged her through a big legal battle. And, you know, she was, she wow. had been paid. Yeah. She'd come from a job where she was making like 10 or 11 bucks an hour. And suddenly mm. she had to be able to pay legal fees to an attorney who charged 350 bucks an hour you know, to keep her life going and keep her kids. And anyway, she came out the other side of that. And not only did she pay every cent of it herself, you know, mm. she like she has climbed the work. La she is anyway, she's one of my heroes. But I've watched how intense that period of life was for her and how many people are feeling that intensity right now. And I just, I have to believe and I have to hope that so much goodness, even for entrepreneurs and business owners and people who are in the space that I serve, like so much will come out of this that that will be apparent to people down the road, uh, maybe in a couple years, like maybe not immediately that, well, that it actually I, served them. And, and well, I mean, first of all, she's going to have grown and developed enormously because of this and you mentioned you know as tough as the diamond and probably shining yes. quite brightly as well yes but think of the inspiration the story would be to her children and her grandchildren and oh it gives me goosebumps ex exactly yeah and and it's also i don't know what folk believe about um an afterlife or multiple afterlives i don't mm -hmm. know but when you think about what we take with us what, what we work hard to achieve in our life there's three essential things three three main categories there's the health or well-being which is your mm -hmm. physical uh, spiritual mental uh, well-being mm -hmm. there's the relationships or love in our life which is friends family community etc and then there's the money side of things which includes businesses or career etc you see of all those areas we create goals and we work and we strive to improve on those areas when we die none of that comes with us you know, we, the, the health is clearly gone because we're dying. Right. Um, the relationships, probably no one's going to do a Romeo and Juliet and decide to go with you at that point. Right. Much the, I love you. Right. <laughs> and the money, you know, I mean, Howard Hughes was the richest man in the world when he died. And, um, you know, I said, if I get so much he left behind, and like, I don't know, was it, yeah, all of it. Yeah. So, so yeah. you don't get to take the health. You don't get to take the relationship. You don't get the money. All those things we, we worked assiduously towards that created. But what we do get is who we become. That's and right. your sister gets that, I believe, for eternity as a part of her, her soul's evolution. And, 
and so that's that's the gift you know there's mm -hmm. that there's that um, little tourism i suppose about the butterfly if you the butterfly has to work very hard to get out of that chrysalis it has to break the crust of that chrysalis and mm -hmm. if someone were to make it easy for the butterfly and pull that crust away that cocoon away the butterfly's wings would never have the fluid in it that they would need to form to but it could fly right so the butterfly only gets to fly through struggle and that's very much like our soul we get to we get freedom and we get fulfillment from effort not from being a jellyfish so the challenges we have one of us none of us wish them into our lives but they're going to be there they're inevitable they're an inevitable part of seeking progress and consciousness mm -hmm. and they the effort is actually the reason we create goals it's not it's not to, to stand at the top of the mountain. It's, it's the development of the journey up the mountain. That's the gift. That's right. It's what we learn about ourselves on, along the way. It's about, and that's so true. Like we have to enjoy the journey because ultimately like that, that is what we have. We have the journey. We don't, you know, so when you, is. when you get that right. But people spend so much time focusing on like, when I get to the top, oh, when I day, do when, this one day, one you day, know, when. For, and it, you know the joke is like, oh well, if you clown, climb Mount Everest, how long do you actually stay at the top? You know, five minutes, ten minutes, thirty minutes, and then you have to come. Well, in my, in my case, I mean, I I climbed uh, Mount Cook, which at the time it actually killed more climbers than Mount Everest, Ooh. and it's not nearly as big, but it's it's a very dangerous mountain. And I can tell you, as little time as possible at the top, right. because it's just sheer ice, and in Cook, it's about a. 45 degree angle and there's a over a one mile drop to the rocks below. So you, you don't stay on that long. Um, and it is, it's all about the journey, but it's, I mean, there's a series of, I guess, train stops along the way, the yeah. milestones, if you like achievements, yeah. which totally. we can pause and celebrate, but our minds are such that if we're wanting to squeeze the, you know, the, the, the last drop of lemon out, of, you know, juice out of the lemon, then we're going to find another mountaintop, right? Yeah. <laughs> No, it's true. I just I, alive and vital is is the next big thing. So I don't think it's a matter of therefore of um, going well. There's no destination, so you know why bother? It's, mm -mm. it's it's a matter of understanding that the journey is the destination. That's right. That's right. No, and I love that. And I think um, you know these types of conversations are so important right now because. Part of my goal, even around creating this podcast, is helping remind people that the, and I see the journey of business or the journey of entrepreneurship much probably in the way that you might, if I were to guess based on our conversation, which is that mm. it is one and the same um, with your personal development journey. I mean, those journeys are intertwined. And for mm. most entrepreneurs that I serve, you don't really get to separate out you know, your personal development or your personal life from the success of your business or your endeavors in business. And so, um, you know, my, my, one of my big goals for this podcast is to remind people that the, the journey of business and the journey of entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. It is about the journey. It is about, you know, certainly reaching new milestones and being able to celebrate those, but also having people share stories about their journeys, about what it was like along the way, not only in the dark places, the valleys, the hard spots, but, you know, what they really learned to move through those and to really bring themselves and their businesses to the next level. So mm -hmm. I know you've got lots of experience in the world of, you know, trying things, testing things. I mean, even your comment about it was through repeated disappointment and nothing really working that you created what you're doing now. Right. So talk to us about some of what you have learned along the way. What are some of the most powerful strategies that you would like to share that people often get wrong? For, for personal development or business development? Business development. Okay. Yep. Um, well, I, I think first of all, you know, and I've already, I've already touched on it, but the most important thing to understand is that if you don't have a predictable flow of high quality leads mm -hmm. coming in, then you don't have any security or certainty around your financial future. Because as an entrepreneur, uh, you wake up, we all wake up every Monday morning effectively unemployed. And <laughs> you know, the, the important check is essentially those new client inquiries that are coming in. So, so I, I think love that's that. I haven't heard that put quite that way before, Tom. <laughs> so, so the, 
Do you think it, I, I call it, you know, the first domino, the, the first mm -hmm. domino is, is what is the thing that you need to do to generate an inquiry? Mm -hmm. And we need that first thing to be systemized and we need it to be produce predictable results. Mm -hmm. So what, so if, if people, if people would agree that they need to devote some care and attention and time to the development of a lead generation system, yep. as opposed to random acts of marketing, um, <laughs> then we start looking at, well, what's the best way of doing that? And if you look at most people have, will go to, um, might go to networking meetings, they might go to business conferences and kind of, you know, hope to get lucky, quote unquote, mm -hmm. uh, business wise, I mean, meet someone who has an interest, hand out business cards. And when you're marketing services or advice, effectively, what you're doing, it, it's far more like you're proposing marriage than it is selling a washing machine. That's right. Because we're actually suggesting someone enters into a relationship with us. Mm -hmm. uh, not one that, you know, ends at the altar or in bed, but still it's a commercial relationship. So if we were to want, if, you know, if I wanted to marry someone or I wanted them to marry me, uh, then I would probably not ask them straight off the bat, right. <laughs> which is the equivalent of going to a business networking media conference and putting my business card on everyone's hands going, you know, pick me, pick me, pick me. Uh, oh. it's, it's, it, it, it generates an aversion. Or oh, it, gosh, it's not, an yes. But, the number of but, ways this goes wrong. Like yeah. one of my pet peeves on LinkedIn, I just have to mention this. One of my pet peeves yeah. on LinkedIn is connecting with somebody and then suddenly being flooded with, here's what I do, check out this page, this my, you know, blah, 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 blah. Like, here's all these links about me, like, go check. And it's, I just find it so yeah, funny. I'm like, so that's what? what I call, that's what I call Hugh Jackman marketing. <laughs> so this comes from a, a short, short, true story. Um, so I'm in, in the kitchen having coffee with my uber pretty German Frau. Mm. And I said to her, and I, I still don't know why I said this, some sort of brain <laughs> sneeze. I said, hey, I've got a question for you. Who would you think is the world's most irresistible man? And she, she goes, quick as a wink, she goes, oh, of course you are, Tom. I said, yeah, oh, sure. good She's answer. Bald, who couldn't go for that, right? I said, no, no, seriously. <laughs> anyway, we, we had a bit of fun around it. And then eventually she goes, it's like, and her eyes light up. She goes, ah, it's like her eyes are popping out of her head. She's going, Hugh Jackman. Yeah, it's Hugh Jackman. And I'm thinking, I've got this image of Hugh Jackman from Werewolf with this torso, bare chest and six pack and teeth and, and claws and these, these big sideboards. And I'm thinking, and I said to her, Hugh Jackman, I get that. I mean, he can sing, he can dance, he can act. He, he's, he's a hunk, a lover. And I mean, he's got a body Adonis would die for. Apparently, he's also a philanthropist and environmentally friendly. Like, yeah. All the things, right. We, we have a winner. So then I had my second brain seize. <laughs> I said, okay, so Hugh Jackman. So let me ask you this. What if there was a knock at the front door right now and you put your coffee down, you walked to the front door, you opened it and it was Hugh Jackman. And he dropped to one knee and he held up this little red velvet box and he flipped it open and it was a diamond ring sparkling in the sunshine. He said to me, you don't know me, but would you make me the happiest man on earth? Would you run away with me and marry me and live with me for the rest of your life? I said to my wife, what would you say to Hugh Jackman if you proposed to you like that? She puts her coffee down and she says, you know, you, Tom, you know, I love you, right? <laughs> I said, yeah, and I think I know what you're going to say next. She says, well, I'm sorry, I'd run away with him. It's Hugh frickin' Jackman. <laughs> and so I'm like wiping a tear out of the corner of my eye and I'm thinking about this. And I'm thinking, well, that was a stupid question to ask. And I said to her, you know, I don't think you need to apologize. She said, why is that? I said, well, if there was a knock at the front door right now and I went there and I opened it and Hugh Jackman proposed to me, I think I'd run away as well. And I'm not even gay. <laughs> it's Hugh freaking Jackman, you know? Right. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, I, I could maybe, you know, change teams or something. I it's Hugh Jackman. Um, anyhow, the reason I tell that story is that a lot of people, when our business consultants uh, got software as a service, the trainers, whatever, the practicing Hugh Jackman marketing, Mm. it's like it's not even a first date yet and you're, you're saying you know here's my business card or you're on linkedin going would you mm -hmm. like seo services today we haven't had a first date yet it's too soon i don't know i don't know you and you're really suggesting we get into a relationship together because any long-term commitment that a client is making to us as a provider of ideas or services or programs or software whatever it is needs a first date and that's if we accept that lead generation, systemized, predictable lead generation is, is, is critical to 
the security and prosperity of any business, then the next step is to understand that we need to give people the opportunity to that first date. And that's why I run webinars, mm-hmm. is because it's like a one hour date with my prospective, the people I might propose to. And I don't propose them till the end of the webinar. And I, and I use webinars because basically I'm antisocial and, you know, I've done hundreds and hundreds of speaking gigs, you know, on stages around the world and I kind of enjoy it, but I got over it. So I just wanted to sit here at home in our beautiful place on the sand next to the, the blue waves and little castaway beach and run webinars, which is what I do. So I regard webinars as being the most efficient the combination of the most efficient and effective first date. Mm-hmm. A funny thing is, I mean, I've been running them since 2008 and, a lot of the colleagues that you and I know have been saying for years, uh, no, you've really got to run physical workshops and seminars, you know, and, and I've been going, okay. And I'm still making some money doing webinars. And now with COVID-19, guess what? They've all decided actually the virtual idea is that works pretty well too. And it does. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You were way ahead of the curve on that one. Um, how well, not, not 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 because i was smart just because i was lazy actually but <laughs> it, it worked out okay either way i know and i don't believe that you're antisocial, but i do hear you on the exhausting part of the in-person you know running I, live workshops or teaching speaking speaking yeah. speaking yeah I, I i can i can tell you i'm definitely antisocial. at our wedding and second marriage for my uber pretty german brown eye mm. you know how you have the groom side and the bride side mm-hmm um, I had one person on the groom side. She had like a hundred on the bride side. I said, my one lonely friend sitting at the front pew going, where is everyone on my side? <laughs> You're it. When we You're had it. bushfires here. We were overseas and we had these wildfires that were coming close to our house. Mm. My wife, I counted them. She had 23 offers of accommodation. Mm. I had none. <laughs> and I you bet. know what? The, the sick part about this is I was really happy with that. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. I was I was about to say, I bet you could have reached out to some of your webinar peeps and they probably would have put you up over here in the States. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> no, but I hear you. And I think, you know, learning webinars, I mean, it's on a lot of people's lists right now. It's a huge focus. Um, whether you call it a webinar or you call it something else. I mean, I hear a lot of hubbub about even using the word webinar. Tell me, though, you know, digging into and for people who are listening, who are thinking like, okay, I really need to lean lean into this and do it right. How does it how does it go wrong? Talk to me about the webinar itself and what you've learned over the years. Yeah, there's a lot to it. And and I think you're right. Webinars have got a a bad rap. And but for good reason is because everyone's offering free training webinars. And it turns out it's some freaking sales ambush where there's countdown timers and scarcity and bonuses and bullshit like that. Um, which works in a market which is young, gullible, naive, or desperate. Um, but it's not, it's not good karma you know, for the presenters, I don't think. Right. <laughs> so, so other than if we take all the hype and the BS and the, the, you know, the bait and switch, which is the free, free training, but it turns out to be stuff, take all that out of it because that, most of us would agree that's not something we want to emulate. Right. Uh, so let's assume that someone wants to, give real value and give some actionable ideas during the webinar. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's, let's take that as our starting point. Two mistakes that are the most common ones, uh, well, several actually, but, and I just released a book on this, by the way, called marketing with webinars and it came out literally a week ago. So marketing, oh, awesome. with, marketing with webinars and okay. Uh, and for people listening, I'll share that link to your book, Tom, in the show notes. And so for folks listening, be sure to go check out legalwebsitewarrior.com forward slash podcast specifically for this book. And there'll be other things. But... Perfect. Thanks, Heather. Yep. So in the book, I go through a bunch of mistakes, but here's some of the highlights. Death by PowerPoint. Yes. All people are seeing is a PowerPoint and there's bullet point and there's bullet point and there's bullet point and then there's an image and there's a... so there's no there's no real captivation and people yes. talk about interaction interaction is a subset of captivation engagement is a, is a subject of captivation and if it's if it's not captivating it's not marketing mm. if it's not captivating it's not marketing that's the standard for webinars it's got to be captivating it's got to be interesting there needs to be there does need to be interaction there needs to be questions mm. there needs to be answers um, if, if someone's not talking, they're not engaged. That's right. It, it, when they, when they, when they are able to share their thoughts, they become engaged. They become invested in the process. 
So death by PowerPoint's a big one. Uh, another really big one is a failure to realize that the enemy of motivation is complication. Mm. So people, newbies to present presentations with webinars or offline or online, make the mistake of thinking they have to dazzle people with how much they know. And, and what, what happens when you present something, a solution that's actually complicated, and most of us, if we're doing what we're doing for any number of years, become specialists. And there are a lot of subtleties and there are a lot of nuances. But it's this confusion between marketing and value delivery, between the presentation and the actual client work, the two complete different things. When we have a client, we've got an extended period of time. We can take them through a series of steps. A complicated process can be broken down into a series of mm. steps so that it's easier and simpler for someone to implement. We can't present that on a webinar, a marketing webinar, because it's too complicated. So the enemy of motivation is complication. When we present the solution, which should be after about half an hour into the webinar, not in five minutes into the webinar. Right, when right. When we present the solution, we've got to present it in such a way that people, it's only three parts. That's my golden rule. Only three parts. If you have, when you present how you work with your clients, three is the magic number. If you do four, you start to lose people. If you do mm. two, it's not enough. Three is the magic number. So there's three parts. My model, you need an audience for your webinars. You need an asset, which is your PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. or your Prezi or whatever it is. And you need a call to action. <laughs> so audience, asset, action, three part mm -hmm. model. Is there mm -hmm. a lot more to it? Of course, there's 51 steps, but if I present 51 steps. So that's some of the big mistakes is mm -hmm. death by PowerPoint, a failure to captivate and complication. Yes. No, those are huge. And I think anybody listening who has <laughs> been through any number of webinars or presentations, period, I mean, you know what death by PowerPoint feels like. Yeah. You know what complication feels like when you're on the receiving end of it. And it's, you know, people check out. They don't engage. They don't. Yeah. They, you know. Miles and so on. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so what are the ways, talk to us a little bit about the work that you do and how you lead clients through this process. Is it strictly through webinars? What are, what's the range of your services? Pretty much it's marketing with webinars. That's, that's yeah. what I do. That's my specialty. So, uh, and, and, and if, if something was better, if something was more efficient and more effective, then I'd be doing that because I love marketing. It's, it's not my first love, it's my second love. My first love is personal development and mm. high levels of consciousness and life purpose mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But, but I do love web marketing because I'm just intrigued and fascinated with the psychology behind it. Uh, and I'm the, the, I love technical stuff and I love gadgets and devices. So webinars really suits me and I am an introvert. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, my wife is the social person. And I find a lot of my clients like the idea of being able to generate new client inquiries right around the world while they still sit at home. Yes. That's, and I, and I, and I, the global reach is another thing because when not only do we reach, you know, have clients in, in England, Ireland, Scotland, Germany, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Canada, the USA, South Africa, Hong Kong, China, Australia, New Zealand. I love the diversity of that. When we have our support calls every week, we have, it's like half the United Nations is on the call. Um, <laughs> And there's a lot of the cross pollinations from cultural styles and Lebanon, <laughs> the client in Lebanon. Um, so uh, Dubai and so on. So you get all these people on a call and mm. they're all contributing to each other and helping each other. And I love the diversity of that, the richness of that. So yes. now I've forgotten your question. No, that's Did right. <laughs> well, yeah, I was asking how, how you work with people, right? If it's right. through this webinar training, webinar process. Um, yeah. well, and I, I know you have a ton of content out there and we'll be sharing um, some gifts with the audience, but there's two things I want to follow up on because I also love that personal development is your first love. It's really mm -hmm. funny because if you could see in this office, I'm literally surrounded by stacks of books. I've got a huge bookshelf over here and over here, you know, overflowing and books everywhere. And I'm a paper book reader. I do not love being on digital devices. Right. But my husband is always teasing me, like, why don't you read something fun? And I, <laughs> right? And all I read is personal development and business. That's it. It's all I've right. ever wanted to read, right? My entire life. And so I'm like, this is fun, right? Every time he sees me pick up a book, why don't you read something fun? And I think in his mind, <clears throat> fun is sci-fi or fantasy or something, you know. Escape a bit, yeah. Totally. And for Re me. Recreational reading. Totally. I like, doesn't matter. Give me a business book. Give me a personal development book. I'm in. 
So right. I love that your first love is personal development. How? Talk to me a little bit about that path. How did you get started down the personal development path? It started when I was 16 years old and drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's we a good thinking. start. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we're getting close to 50 years ago. Um, I, I left home at a, at a young age and mm. I was still going to be putting myself through through, through high school uh, mm. as, as a 16-year-old, but I wasn't living at home anymore. My parents had divorced and it was, you know, it was, it was difficult for them and so on. And uh, for me, it was a dose of freedom. I just, I mean, I felt I was sad my parents were breaking up. I cried about mm. that. But for me, it was like I had, I bought myself a little motorbike and, I had freedom. It's amazing. And, um, but I very quickly saw patterns of alcoholism repeating, you know, that I could see in my, my mm. forefathers, if you like. And, uh, as a 16 year old, um, sowing some wild oats and being too free, I suppose. Um, I, I was, I, I got scared and I still remember it was, it was an autumn night and I was literally lying on the back lawn of, this uh, mixed student flat that I was living in and uh, I was alone. I was just staring at the night sky and I, I just really felt very upset and kind of mm. scared and alone and afraid because I could see these patterns that a 16 year old starting to repeat. So I decided that I would study, you know, I had friends doing, starting to do law degrees or medical degrees or whatever. And I decided I would study success. Mm. Cause it occurred to me that that was the most important subject. <laughs> Success, mm -hmm. you know, so, so it's been a, it's been, it really has almost been a literally a lifelong journey and through uh, Christian traditions, through Eastern mysticism, uh, different spiritual paths. Uh, my first book I wrote on, it was called, it's called Your Extraordinary Life. It's now in the third edition. Mm. And I put together on the basis of that, um, you know, that was, that was a moderately successful book introduced the concept of life purpose to people of goal setting of um, what happiness really is and it surprises a lot of people to when they when they understand my my proposition around happiness fulfillment how to set goals how to clear dysfunctional emotions from the mind uh, so your extraordinary life that was that sort of the, the summation of half a lifetimes of learning um, yeah. and just recently we created a companion course for that so people could go through step by step and actually implement the book into their life so that's life planningcourse.com is completely free. People can go there and, and figure out their life purpose, figure out how to be happy, set mm. goals. And achieve. I love that. That's amazing. I, you know, it's, it's interesting again, relating back to your story and what happened out of that period of, it sounds like some tough times in your family, you know, personally still being a kid. Um, I always find it interesting, and I even look <clears throat> at my own family. My mom died young. My siblings were, I was second oldest at the time, but, you know, my youngest siblings were 13 and 14. They still had high school years ahead of them, and, um, you know, it was a very different type of loss for them because they hadn't been through some of those formative years. And, right. you know, I even look at what's happening now in our family and in life generally, and I just find it so fascinating that some people – will go through something very, very hard. And like you did, look for the way out, look for the opportunity, look for, you know, kind of the meaning and what that means for them in the next phase yeah. versus people who just stay in the very dark places and stay, you know, making choices that really end up just mm. making life harder. I, I think, you know, some people are not aware that there's a choice. Mm. by reason of programming, whether it's parental programming, television programming, God knows what, but, but that is really the point of power when people become aware mm. that they do have a choice that they, mm -hmm. yes, this thing has happened and how much they contributed to it. We could debate that, but this thing has happened. Now, what am I going to do? And some people are conditioned and programmed that they don't have a choice that it sucks and they just got to wear it. And other people somehow become aware that there's a choice that they could make an effort and recreate it. It might be a long path. There might be a lot of steps involved, but yes, I've got to start that and have some faith and some confidence that there's, that I can change this. So I, that's, that to me is the point of power is that awareness. Mm -hmm. So little things like the practice of mindfulness, maybe in the shower or brushing my teeth and becoming aware of the sensations. Um, a morning exercise I run for many years is, in my morning exercise, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? What am I smelling? What am I mm. touching? What am I tasting? 
then that creates a level of consciousness and awareness. So we can practice becoming aware. Mm -hmm. We can practice, and that, that awareness then gives us, as I said, the opportunity to make a choice. What am I going to do about this? No, and it's interesting I because I think that for anybody listening, I mean, I know in my own life I have definitely seen when somebody is what I call like remaining a victim. They see themselves as a victim. They repeat, but I've never thought about that from the perspective of maybe they actually don't perceive that they have a choice. Right. Right. I hadn't thought about it in that framework that it's actually like they're not even, right. you know, foot in the door thinking that they have a, a choice at all. Instead, I've yeah. always seen it as like they're just choosing they're, to remain a victim. That, yeah, that's right. But many times they're not. Uh, the, I, my, my attitude towards this changed when I did, I did volunteer prison work. I mm. used to go into prison and teach things like self-esteem, personal responsibility, which mm. is interesting when you've got a, a group of inmates who all swear to God they didn't do it. Uh, so personal responsibility uh, being the key to change. You know, if, I, yeah. if I'm responsible, I am able That's to it. respond. That's right. Whereas if I'm reactive, I just continue to react and experience the same thing. So all that sort of good stuff, which 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 I absolutely loved, and it was, but it was a revelation to many of them. And I did something that I wasn't aware I wasn't allowed to do. Um, I actually interviewed every student from that was going to be in my class before the class, and. Mm. obviously the prison authorities knew I was interviewing them, but I asked them questions that I didn't realize till later. I wasn't meant to ask them like, what are you in here for? How long is your sentence? But I also asked them things like, tell me about your family, uh, which got some interesting reactions. And 90% of them were one of the last children in a long line of children that were unwanted by their parents. They might have been 12th out of 14 or 16th out of 16 kids. And they were passed mm. off from grandparents to uncles, to aunts, to foster parents. Their role models were often people that had never worked for money, that had gone from generation to generation on welfare. I mean, mm. tragically difficult circumstances, illness, sicknesses, disease. The people that had quote unquote made it in their circles were dealing drugs or right. set up whatever ring and et cetera. And I walked out of those interviews, so this is over a series of a couple of weeks, stunned at my own ignorance and my own arrogance about how I had thought we all had the same choice. Right. S some people don't have the advantages that, that I had when I was growing up. So how dare I look down my nose at them and say, you victim, you, why don't you step up, you know? Yeah, <laughs> they, no, just, it's... They, they weren't brought up with that programming. Right. Right. No. And I think that's a, that's a powerful shift to make is I think we can all recognize when we have different levels of privilege, but you forget to apply that to the mind, right? Different yeah. levels of privilege around mindset or okay. resilience right. or grit or any of the other things that, yeah. you know, we have opportunities to develop in life. And it's, yeah. I think that's, yeah, it's a really, really powerful example of that. Um, I always remember the programming of thinking. I mean, we set a goal setting exercise and um, used to run workshops and out of prison, also in prison. And I, I mentioned, okay, we're going to have a breakout group. And they all stopped and they all looked at each other. And one of them put their hand up and said, um, when you say breakout group, do you mean what <laughs> we think you mean? No, 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 no. I mean, just smaller groups of people. <laughs> anyway. So it was to create a goal and then they'd set a goal and they'd come back and they'd share their goal. And one of them, yeah. this, this is how they were thinking. One of the guys was in there, was in there and said, I, I've got a goal. I've got a goal. I want to have the biggest marijuana crop in my state. Now at the time, marijuana was very illegal <laughs> and certainly growing it commercially. And here he was in prison, setting a goal. Announcing it. To get back into prison. <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> Okay, let's go back again to values. Let's revisit this one. <laughs> but that was the thinking. This was the way you were successful. Is you have you yeah. can't make it mainstream because you didn't have the education, you didn't have the opportunities, you didn't have the connections. So you really to get to get loved and to get money and to get family and to get a wife, you had to do something illegal, right? Mm. Mm. Interesting. It is very very interesting. Um, I mean, there's so much in that conversation we can unpack. I'm still wondering what is your definition of success, both success and happiness? 
Well, okay. So first of all, let's go with success. I mentioned before mm -hmm. health relationships and money, the health being physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, etc. The relationships being a friend to a family, our loved ones, a wider community, the world really relationships and the financial side being business or career and money, personal legacy, financial and so on. Mm -hmm. So my definition of success is anyone who's making progress in all three areas simultaneously mm -hmm. definition. So by that definition, um, I could think of a certain person who's in charge of a very large company, country politically, uh, who has lots of real estate developments to me, not successful because that, that person's not making progress in certain areas of well-being. clearly. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so, or you get the Olympic athlete who, and it's an extraordinary achievement to win a gold medal, but if they've riddled their body with steroids and are dead at 38, that is not a definition of success. So, and by the same definitions, one of these prisoners that I was talking about, that's working on their physical and mental health, that's, that's right. trying to be kinder to other people, there are fellow inmates around them, and that's perhaps saving, you know, a dollar out of the $2 a week they get paid, that person is, is successful. Oh, that is so, I, I mean, I love your perspective on that, even as I relate that to my own life. So there's a program in the States. Actually, he's taken it worldwide now. It's run by a man called Howard Glasser, named Howard Glasser, and it's the um, Children's Success Foundation. You can find him online, but he has a program called the Nurtured Heart Program for children, and most of these kids usually are at risk, or, you know, they've got some, I mean, generally diagnosis or something that would be considered as the disability that, you know, interrupts their ability to, to engage in a right. pro-social manner to be in school and be, you know, a productive, happy child or at home. And I'm so in love with his program because, and I, I have a child with special needs and which is how I got introduced to the program. But the, the correlation in your definition, and as I like relate it even to our children in the world who are struggling is that we have the opportunity and the shift in mindset, even as adults observing other adults and trying to, you know, measure success or really see, you know, what's working and what is not is I think we all have massive opportunity to look at that differently. Mm -hmm. And just like our children who are struggling, you know, any moment that certain children are not hitting other kids or are not swearing or not doing something that is considered, you know, not a pro-social behavior is actually a win. Like that's the absence, but that's right, that's success. And, and yeah. so Howard Glasser's entire program is really around rewiring the brain of the parent and rewiring the brain of yeah. the support staff in like, let's say a juvenile detention center right. around actually seeing these kids as successful in every right. moment that, you know, the absence of a yeah. negative behavior is there and acknowledging them for that success and showing them the ways that they are already successful. So that's what right. I, I mean, I just, I saw that in even just the way that you described how those inmates are being successful. And I think it's so powerful yeah we, we all, all any of us can do is something with what we've got and oh. our the base level that we start from certainly it's relevant to us but in, in regard to success and making progress it's completely irrelevant it is what it is so whatever money we have whatever lack of or small gram of patience i might have somewhere whatever vestige of human kindness or compassion i might have can i grow that Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the concept of PB, personal best. Mm -hmm. now, can I be a little better than I was yesterday? Because if I can do that, and I can do that in the areas of health and relationships and financially, regardless of how small that step might be, of how insignificant that drop of progress might appear, it's success mm -hmm. because I'm moving forward, right? Um, you, you asked about happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, happiness is what happens when you take the garbage out. <laughs> It's what's left. It's what was there originally. It's our, it's our, our state of emptiness. Uh, if you want to be more specific, it's, it's a state of mind, which is devoid of emotion. Mm. And I'm not saying emotion should be avoided and I'm not saying it's good or I'm saying it's bad. I'm just mm -hmm. saying that happiness, happiness is like the color white. You white, white is a result of not being any color. Right. Happiness is the result of the not being an emotion. Black, mm which we use as a, as the color representing depression is a combination of all colors. So it's not a bad analogy, if you like, for the state of ha happiness is what happens when you take the garbage out. Happiness is what 
Happiness is what you experience in the slice of time where you're devoid, you're empty of emotion. And emotion should not be avoided. Emotion should not be suppressed. And chapter 49 of the book, uh, Your Extraordinary Life, I go into how to, how to dissolve dysfunctional emotion so that mm -hmm. you, you and it's a, it's a practice. It's like a golf practice or a piano practice or a language practice. We get better at happiness by practicing it, but we need the right technique to practice. Otherwise, we don't improve. Right, absolutely. And you said you, you have a section on how to dissolve dysfunctional emotion. Talk to me just for a minute about what that means. It's, it's called the four forces model. It's awareness, acceptance, affirmation, and action. Hmm. So I mentioned before that the point of power is when we become aware of something. That's right. So when we, you know, someone pulls in front of us in, on, in the freeway or something, we at some point we become aware that we're angry. Right. And it might be two days later and you think, God, oh, man, I really lost my rag, you know, in the car that, and, or it might be a minute later, mm -hmm. but at some point become aware that we had this emotional reaction. <clears throat> that's the point of power. Mm. And that's when we can, that's when we can say, Oh, how come my old friend anger? So we are accepting of the emotion mm. and that's whatever we resist. We make stronger. If you want to make your bicep stronger, you do resistance training with weights. We resist something gets stronger. If we beat ourselves up and go, oh man, I'm a bad person. I got angry. Oh, I wish I wasn't. Oh, I don't want to feel anger. Do we actually make that response stronger the next time? So mm -hmm. we we can dissolve. I call it dysfunctional emotion because I don't want, don't want to say emotion is good or bad. It's just not functional relative to what we want to achieve. Right. If we want to achieve happiness and we're getting angry, that's a dysfunctional. It's not functioning relative yep. to our goal of happiness. Got so it. awareness and then acceptance is where we can sit down. And we can breathe deeply because that releases more chemicals in the brain, which is why we're feeling the emotion. It's, it's nothing more than chemicals in the brain. And we sit down and we state the facts around what just happened and we, and we add to the end of it and that's okay. So someone just pulled in front of me in the middle and, and that's okay. And we neutralize mm -hmm. the thought that this was a bad thing. We're not by saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, but that it's okay. And there's, mm. there's more in chapter 49, but it's a it's a step by step process which you can very easily and simply dissolve dysfunctional emotion into the nothingness that it always was. <laughs> oh, I love that! Oh my goodness! Well, I um, I'm going to include your free course. First of all, I love that it's free and that it's a resource out there living in the world. The life planning course. Um, it make the world a better place. Yeah, no, I love that so much. So I'm going to include that link in right. our show notes. Um, what else, before we sign off, what else would you like folks to know? I mean, we've covered a lot in this conversation. You know, from the business perspective, everybody needs what you've got, especially right now. You know, yeah. the the opportunity to learn about how to create consistent leads, how to do webinars the right way. There's so many ways that they're done wrong. <laughs> I, I will be one of your next students in that regard. Um, but what else would you like people to know about you, about how to connect with you? Anything else before we sign off? Well, I, I do try to get respond to everyone's email. So email address is tom at leadsology.guru and not guru as in my God is a master, but more just authenticity. G U R U. So that's oh, the way I like to describe it. I like um, it. And on that note, um, my encouragement with people would be to listen to their first thought. Hmm. When they have a problem, when they have a challenge, when they have a question, listen carefully to your first thought, your first inclination, what your first, what comes up first, because that will always be the answer. That will always be the step that you should take forward. When mm. the doubts come in, they're the ones you don't listen to. So listen to your first thought because that's, that's your intuition speaking before you start feeling emotions associated with this problem or challenge. Listen to your first thought because that's the key to moving forward. Oh, I love that so much. I mean, the power of that before we start running everything through our filter, right? And then really digesting it in usually the wrong way. Um, yeah, putting it on a spreadsheet and yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. Oh, I love that. I think that's um, a great piece of advice. Well, Tom, I'm so grateful. I'm just personally grateful that we had the chance to connect today. And I'm super excited to share everything that you have spoken about today with our listeners. Um, I hope everybody will pop in. Definitely check out the resources. I'll include Tom's contact information. Tom, I hope I, hope I get to have you back again. I look forward to it, Heather. I've really appreciated the opportunity to, to you know, get out from uh, my little world and my little ivory tower and share some <laughs> ideas. I love it. Well, I just wish I had a little bit of your beat as I sit here in my gray office in a basement in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like you made it pretty cozy. It is cozy. I had to give up because of COVID. I had to give up our play space upstairs so that, you know, my two wild little munchkins actually have some place to run around and it's got sunshine wow. even on the <laughs> the Don't rainy days. Locked down with two little kids. <laughs> I has to go to work because he's an essential worker. That's right. I get to up level all my skills at the same time, Tom. So that's what I'm working towards. <laughs> all right. So good to know you. Thanks, Heather. Yep. Thanks for being here. Bye, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>